<laughs> Anybody else tired of the gray, rainy days? But uh, we're grateful that you're here, uh, no matter the weather, and grateful that you chose to worship with us this morning. Um, we'd love to have you connect with us, and so if you're visiting with us today, you can text the word welcome to the number on the screen or just use the QR code there um, and connect with us so that we can better learn how to serve you and um, grow with you as you walk with the Lord. Also, if you have been visiting with us for a while and you are interested in knowing what it means to be a part of our church family permanently, we would love, well, permanently, as, uh, as much as anything is permanent in our world, but um, in uniting with us in church membership, we'd love to have you join us for Discovering Eastview. It's going to be next Sunday, right after church, following the service in the GO building, um, which is the education building over there. Um, and uh, we just need to know that you're planning to join us so that we can make sure that we have lunch for you um, as well. So if you'll let uh, one of the pastoral team know, that would be great. We'd love to have you do that. Also, if you'd like to know more about what we're doing and um, how we are loving God, serving others, and going into the world as a church family, you can join the loop. Um, you text the same number um, that was up on the screen earlier, but you use the word loop instead of welcome, or you can use the QR code um, as well. Next, we have Men's Brotherhood meeting for breakfast um, next Saturday morning at 7.30. There is going to be a special guest I hear, um, Sheriff Tolson, and um, he's a, a strong believer and um, public servant in our community, and so men, I know you will want to come out and hear what he has to say um, in terms of encouragement for you. That's next Saturday morning. Then we are going to um, have a church-wide chili cook-off and summer camp fundraiser in the dead of winter. We thought it'd be super fun to cozy up together and talk about camp <laughs> and um, celebrate that we get to send kids to camp. So we would love for you to participate in all the parts of it or in just a couple of ways. So let me tell you how you can be a part. If you would like to make some chili to go in the cook-off, there should be a card in the pew that you can fill out and um, return today. Where did they put that? In the offering box or give it to Jackie Kirkland. Um, also, there's going to be soup. For those of you who are not chili eaters, there will be chicken noodle soup, so um, still come and eat even if you're not a chili person. And um, please invite a friend. This would be a really fun thing for you to invite someone um, to come to. It's just us fellowshipping together and um, raising money to send the next generation to camp. So with that part of it, we are going to have um, an auction of gift baskets. And we would love for you to put your creativity to use and think about what would be something that you would really enjoy getting. Um, if you were going to buy a gift basket or a gifted one, what would you want? Would you want a movie night? Would you want a spa day? Or um, would you want outdoor items or different things? So we'd love for you to get together with a friend um, or a small group and put that together. Or um, you can do one on your own. They just need to be dropped off at the church office. Um, that says January 25th, but I think it's actually the 26th, which is Thursday, and that's when the church office is open from 9 to 2. Um, and then we'll auction those off, and those details will be coming next Sunday about how the auction is going to work for those of you who would like to think about purchasing. But all of your, um, all of the proceeds will go to um, send our kids to camp next summer. Also, the children are going to be baking things to. Um, so, so they're going to have a little bake sale table set up that night, and you can buy your dessert, um, a little brownie or cookie or something, um, and those monies will also um, go to camp. Uh, I think that covers it. So thank you all. Let's worship together. Well, thank you all for being here this morning. Thankful for Miss Sarah and giving us those announcements. Y'all give her a hand, because she did a great job. As far as the baskets were concerned, this does not just have to be a lady thing, all right? You know, man, we can, we can do the grilling basket, or, you know, if you want to, you can put some ammunition in a basket. I think there would probably be some being that would take place on Sunday morning. 
So just, just a thought there, if you wanted to have that kind of a basket. But I wanted to invite you to be with to go to the Lord in prayer with me. Father, I am thankful for this morning, thankful for the time that we have. We can come together and we can praise you. Lord, we can laugh together this week we cry together. And Lord, now we're here to worship you together. And Lord, as we come together, may this be beautiful to you, Lord. Because we believe in you. That's why we're here to worship you. That's why we came together together. Today, Lord, that's why we're here. It's to worship you. So let this time be about you. And about you alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <coughs> Stand together as we sing this I believe.
invite you to read these words of scripture with us as Mike Smith leads us. Psalm 1. Yeah. Psalm 146, 1 through 10. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in the Son of Man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord of God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who believes faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord now and stand as we sing together. Who you say I am.
Good morning, everyone. Great opportunity for us to be in the Word of God. So Isaiah 42, we'll read some of this later as we leave today. But Isaiah 42 reminds us that um, our God is a God who created the heavens and stretched them out. We spent some time in our quick prayer this morning. Uh, that's a great reminder that um, the church gathers at 8.30 on Sunday mornings to pray. Pray for one another, to pray for our community, to pray for our world, to pray for our church, to pray for the church. Uh, we invite you at any time to come join us at 8.30. But this morning we were looking specifically at Isaiah 42 because I knew we would get to the latter part of the chapter uh, in our benediction today. But verse 5 really struck me. As it says, you know, thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out. And I, I started to think about saran wrap. Now, that's that stuff that comes in a roll. And you roll it out and it's really tricky. If you don't use it the right way, you can mess things up and then you waste it. And you have to get another piece. And, but, but when you think about that, you're covering your 9 by 13 casserole. You take that saran wrap out and roll it out and then you stretch it over that 9 by 13 pan. And it's supposed to seal it up and make it good for the refrigerator, not for the freezer so much. But I thought about how when we look up at the heavens, they seem so vast. The expanse is limitless. The depthness of the cold, we were talking about that earlier this week, and this cold that we're feeling today, it's nothing compared to the cold of outer space. And God sits above that. And he speaks about stretching the heavens out like it's a piece of saran wrap, and whoop, oh, there's the heavens. That's the kind of God we get to serve, one who is over even the heavens. And so we've come to worship him today. So I want us to pray as we begin our time together. Praying to the God who created the heavens and stretched them out, Isaiah says. Father, as we come before your word today, we recognize that we humbly come before the God of the universe who sits enthroned above all creation, who stretched out the heavens, and yet notices us. Who are we that the king of the universe would take notice of us? May we marvel today, Father, that you receive glory in giving grace to undeserved sinners like me and like us. Today I ask that you might remind us of <coughs> your delight in opening the eyes of the blind. I thank you for giving the believers in this room today spiritual eyesight. Not so that we can become puffed up or conceited in our wisdom or our knowledge, but so that we might do the works while it is still day. Because night is coming when there won't be time to do work anymore. Until then, may we be found faithful, proclaiming that Christ has set us free. That in our Father's house there are many rooms. You've gone to prepare a place. You said you were, and we believe it. You said you were coming back one day to take the redeemed home, and we believe it. And you sent us out to go and tell others about this hope that's available in Jesus Christ. So may we not faint or grow weary in well-doing. Forgive us for the opportunities that you gave us this week that we passed by. We did not speak up for you. We did not stand for truth. Maybe we even delighted in the nonsense on social media. We liked it. We, we shared it. Forgive us, God, for those ways in which we have misrepresented you to the world through even something like social media. 
pray for our nation, pray for our leaders. God, you have instituted government over us, and you will use our president, vice president, Congress, our local representatives to accomplish your ultimate purpose. But you told us to, to pray for them, and so we do, that they might have your wisdom to lead and guide. Thank you for the Gospel of John, and thank you for this text today. Love you, Jesus, and pray this in your name. Amen. Well, Jesus has left the building. In John chapter 8, he left the building. And it certainly wasn't with the sound of screaming fans. That phrase became popular with Elvis, right? And everybody was in the room, and they thought if he would just come out for an encore, um, and the announcers would have to say over and over again that Elvis has left the building, and now in John chapter 8, Jesus has left the building, and he wasn't going to come back for an encore performance at this point because they were wanting to stone him, if you remember, at the end of last week. He had made this incredible declaration that before Abraham was, I am. Notice Jesus didn't say before Abraham was, I was, as if Jesus was simply born on the earth at a time before Abraham and was still miraculously living. No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said before Abraham was, I am taking on the revealed name of God given to Moses at the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3, declaring not that he was born before Abraham, but that he eternally existed before Abraham. Jesus was making abundantly clear that what identified God identified him. Jesus is the true author of Abraham's identity and the hope of his promise. Jesus didn't come to destroy the hope and promises of Israel. He's the one who authored the promises upon which Abraham trusted his life and his family's heritage. And so for us today, he's also the author of our identity. Now, that statement is extremely volatile in today's cultural uh, world, especially with the progressives who claim we can choose our identity. And really, it's coming undone. The U.S. Census Bureau uh, is having a hard time accurately counting us. That became uh, evident last week in an article because they're not sure what categories or how many categories we should have in that category where we used to just have male and female. But now we have included that list and the U.S. Census Bureau is in a mess because they don't know how to count us anymore. We, though, have the opportunity to speak truth. We get to speak with, with, with authority, God's word as authority, to those who may be struggling in this area, all right? Well, the U.S. Census Bureau is afraid to, to not have the right amount of checkboxes. We can show the right amount of checkboxes are two, male or female. That's it. But for those who may be struggling with that, we offer the hope, the same hope that, that was offered to us. We came to know the, the God of the universe. When our eyes are open to the truth. Rejecting God's authority in our lives only leads to great hurt. It leads to great hurt in the present life, and it leads to eternal darkness for the future. And it's that darkness that Jesus came to rescue us from. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus declared, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He was in the temple. They were having the big celebrations. Remember, we talked about the big cauldrons that were stories tall. Light was flaring up out of those cauldrons. And Jesus walks out among them and says, I'm the light of the world. You've been lighting these things as representatives of me, but I am the light. People weren't too thrilled about that again at the end of chapter 8. They weren't stunned. So as he's left there, we know the religious elites wanted nothing to do with Jesus. So in this instance, at the end of 8, they picked up those stones. They want to kill him. Jesus slips out. Jesus would only die on his terms. We talked about this last week. He's in charge of the universe. He's the one who stretched out the heavens. So he hid himself. John 8 tells us he left the temple with the disciples in tow. It was really a visual portrayal of what it looks like when the light of the world goes out into the darkness of the world. Their path brought them to an encounter 
with a beggar on the side of the road. So if you have your copy of God's Word, we're not actually in Isaiah 42, we're in John chapter 9. So open your copy of God's Word there, please. John chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. As he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth. Now, according to an alliance that does research on aging, someone becomes blind or visually impaired every seven minutes in the United States. Now, that's different from the man that we meet in our text this morning who was born blind. He never seen the beauty of God's creation. He never saw the faces of his loved ones. He never saw light, only darkness. And so this man serves as a picture of those who are apart from Christ, walking in darkness and having never seen the beauty of God. Well, Jesus stopped. He halted the entourage with him and he took notice. Those whom society was quick, that's quick to toss out as a worthless blind beggar, Jesus saw with compassion. And so today, friend, I want you to know that Jesus notices you. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, he sees you and he cares about you. He's with us and he knows every kind of disappointment or struggle we experience. He notices your cries of lament for healing. He hears you. He knows. He sees your tears for lost loved ones. He notices your loneliness. He understands your pain. He invites you to cast whatever it is you're going through onto him and allow him to shoulder the burden. He triumphed over death, after all, and he comes to us now so that he may communicate to us his joy of victory, saying, hang on, we're almost there. I'll be with you all the way home. When Jesus stopped and took notice of this blind beggar, I wanted us to take a moment and consider our response when we encounter society's outcasts. Are we quick to embrace and offer help, or are we quicker to allow our minds to judge and pass on by? I thought this quote in the Baptist Courier this month by Dr. Robert Jackson was worth sharing. He said, it's at the interface of human misery and God's mercy that we find the greatest opportunities for ministry. That interface, where those two connect, human misery and God's mercy, offer us a great opportunity for ministry. The disciples, however, they seemed more interested in the why of this man's blindness instead of showing any compassion to address him. They simply wanted to know his story. They, not, they weren't necessarily expecting Jesus to do anything. Look at their question in verse 2. Uh, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? It was a common Jewish belief that if a disability like blindness from birth uh, it, it had to be connected to some sort of hereditary cause. Now, that's an often uh, legalistic outlook. Remember, legalism is an attempt to earn God's favor through our own righteous works, and it builds upon the idea that if I can earn God's favor by good works, then the more good works I do, the more God becomes indebted to me. He's required to reward my good deeds with blessings. Something bad happens to me. Legalism says it must be because I did something bad. And so with that legalistic mindset, the disciples look at this blind man from birth, blind from birth, and concluded that he either sinned in the womb or his parents committed some egregious sin because if they had not done something wicked, God would be forced to respond with blessings. And Jesus had zero tolerance for legalism. So he offers an explanation in verse 3. Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. This man's blindness was serving a much greater purpose. Now Jesus is not claiming that this man or his parents were sinless. That's not what he's saying here. 
He is, though, putting to death the idea that one's suffering was automatically tied to disobedience. Are there consequences for our sinful choices? Absolutely. But not all of our suffering is part of some sort of punitive retribution. Jesus is making clear the man was born blind so that Jesus could use his blindness to point to a greater spiritual blindness and show how he was the light of the world. Now that's some clear vision for us, right? In God's sovereignty, he makes man serviceable for his own glory in any way that he sees fit. How often, though, we view our trials legalistically. We cry, God, how could you let this happen to me? Haven't you noticed all I've been doing for you? Then we get to the real hard work and we try to stop the trial. All the while, missing that God has a bigger purpose in our suffering. To prematurely disconnect from the trial would be to miss out on the display of God's glory in the trial. This is what Jesus is saying here. Life's struggles are meant to be vehicles for God to show himself. How would our lives be different if we cried out, show me more of yourself in a trial instead of get me out of this trial? How would our lives be different? Only God knows the why of the trials that we go through. But God's promise is that he brings good out of everything that he allows us to experience. What kind of glory would God get through the healing of a blind beggar? Well, he'd get to prove himself to be sent from God to be the true light of the world. It was the work that he was sent to do. Look at verses 4 and 5. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Christ had work to do while he was on earth, and it was a relatively short period of time for him. We, too, must do the work that he's called us to do while it is still day. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus calls us the light of the world. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is standing there in John 8 saying, I am the light of the world. Then you get into his Sermon on the Mount in 514, and he says, you're the light of the world. We who are in Christ are to penetrate and permeate the darkness, to be in the world, but not of the world, to be as visible as a table lamp on a, in a dark house or as lit up as a fully lit sky skyscraper against a blackout sky. How do we do this? We have to work the works while it's still day. Christianity is made both most visible through good works. Good works are actions that God has commanded us to do in his holy word that are fruit and evidence of a true and lively faith. Can we earn our salvation by good works? Absolutely not. But are we to do good works for those of us who are in Christ? Yes, we are. As Christians live out the word of God, non-Christians start to see the beauty and the hope and the attractiveness and the truthfulness of Jesus Christ. The church, the task is urgent. Night is coming. There won't be any more work to do. That then it will be time to show our works and receive according to what we have done. Christ's work in John chapter 9 looked like restoring sight with a greater purpose in mind. Let's pick up in verse 6. Having said these things, I remember he wasn't talking to the blind man. He was talking around him. He saw him, but he wasn't speaking to him. He was talking to the disciple. But having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with his saliva. And he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sin. So he went and washed and came back, seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is not this the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It's he. Others said, No, it's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how are your eyes open? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. The author of life, the one who formed man from the dust of the earth, took some dust and made mud pies with his spit. You ever seen what dry clay and wetness looks like? I got some for you here. This comes from my boy's soccer cleats. 
when they're standing in the driveway, pounding it out in the driveway, um, which I know my wife is grateful doesn't end up in our kitchen, uh, but this is just one little sample. This is what it looks like. So imagine you're, you're making this clay uh, mixture, Jesus' spits, it's forming it like that, and then it, it hardens up on the man's eyes, okay? Put yourself in the blind man's position for just a minute. Someone has knelt down beside you, someone who hasn't introduced himself, someone who hasn't said, I'm here to help you. Someone's just knelt down beside you and they rub some dirt on your eyes and you start to feel it harden on your face and the man tells you, go wash in the pool called scent. And you can imagine this man is used to making a scene in town. He's used to stumbling down the streets with his cane, or maybe he's often seen being led by the hand with the assistance of a friend. But going through town with mud on your face may have seemed a bit much. Couldn't Jesus have just said something like, be healed, and the man's sight restored? Yes, but that's not how Jesus was going to get the most glory. And so can you imagine as the man was being led to the pool, how his heart must have swelled with all kinds of emotions. And as he brought his water to, I mean his face to the water and washed the mud off his eyes, we can only imagine with wonder as his eyes were open what it must have been like to see his reflection for the first time. He'd heard about light. Now he could see it. Someone had tried to describe a flower to him before. Now he could observe its beauty up close. Oh, that's what a street looks like, he says. Can you see him dropping his cane and saying, see ya, to his friend who is helping him, and running into his neighborhood saying, take a look at me now. Jesus restored the sight of the blind man. And it wasn't the pH of Jesus' saliva that mixed with the clay it wasn't the chemicals in the pool of Siloam. It was the power of Jesus alone. This man could do nothing to make himself see. All he could do was what Jesus told him to do. Now, this man's restored sight was a gateway to a much greater darkness that he needed to be healed from. Remember, John tells us why he wrote this book. He said these signs, these miracles were written so that we might believe. They were written to teach deeper spiritual truths. And so the rest of this chapter helps us see the progression of spiritual growth this man goes through as his spiritual eyes are opened through a series of interrogations. Physical blindness was not this man's greatest concern. Just like, his, uh, and just like the healing of this physical blindness, there was nothing this man could do to receive and experience true life. Jesus was going to have to do it for him. But as the man rounded the corner and entered his neighborhood and gazed upon his house for the first time, the busybody neighbors weren't so sure about what to make of all the commotion. Some said, isn't that our blind neighbor? Many people affirm, yeah, yeah, that's him. But some naysayers were quick to point out, no, nah, it's just somebody who looks like him. The man himself had to affirm it really was him. No, it really is me. It's, it's me. Still unsure, they want to know what happened. So the religious leaders feel like that's, uh, you know, the, they're the ones who have the authority. And so the, neighbor, the neighbors are like, well, who should take him to them? And so the reason everyone is caught up on the how is because they really want to know the who. Really, religious leaders do not want to face the fact that Jesus had healed the man, or even that the man had been healed. The blind man offers a retelling of the events in his own words. All was that a person who'd done the miracle was a man called Jesus. He hadn't seen our Lord, of course. He only heard his voice. Not only was the beggar ignorant of Jesus' identity, but he didn't know where Jesus had gone. Well, while he wasn't sure where Jesus was now, he had a new story to tell. He went, he washed, he sees. Immediate obedience Unlike Naaman, remember in the Old Testament, who hesitated to receive his healing because it seemed too ridiculous? There should be, just like this man and his neighbors, there should be a noticeable difference between our old self and our new self. You know, the neighbors immediately noticed something was different about the blind man. Our new life in Christ must effect change. But that change just shouldn't be noticeable at conversion. 
I was so encouraged by a dear sister in Christ a couple of weeks ago. She's followed Christ for decades, and she shared with me how she noticed growth in her thoughts of a specific event, and, and that those thoughts about that event changed as a result of her spiritual growth. Her affections were changing, and that's wonderful. The things of the world seemed less appealing. May that be said of us. The world may say we're snobs. They may say we're standoffish because we don't celebrate the things they do, but we can consider their reviling as a badge of honor for the king. The neighbors of the blind man, they wanted further clarification. Instead of delighting in the miracle, instead of being joyful about what happened, they'd rather make sure that those religious elites had a say in the matter. We know the Pharisees were the religious establishment. They didn't like Jesus because he called out their self-righteousness. They knew the scriptures. They knew that Isaiah and others spoke about the coming Messiah who would open the eyes of the blind. So when a miracle like this showed up, it warranted an investigation, especially if it involved Jesus, whom they despised so fiercely. So look at verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees says, This man is not from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who's a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he's opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. Jesus' miracles generally stirred up three types of responses. Some believed. Some believed and they gave God the glory. Others refused to say the miracles substantiated his claims of being God. And others just flat out refused to believe in the miracle itself. itself. All three of those responses are evident in this miraculous healing. So here's an investigation. Number one, the Pharisees thought they had this case wrapped up right from the start. Jesus' act of deliberately healing the man on the Sabbath day caused great concern for the Pharisees. It was illegal to work on the Sabbath, and so apparently by making clay and applying the clay and healing the man, Jesus had performed three unlawful works. So no way he could be a man of God because he's broken all these three laws. Well, the Pharisees should have been celebrating the blind man that he was healed, but instead they wanted to prosecute Jesus. God's law didn't condemn anything that Jesus did for the man, but the Pharisees had come up with their own list of laws, and one of them strictly outlined the don'ts of the Sabbath day. So Jesus, having healed on the Sabbath, breaking God's law in the minds of the Pharisees was proof positive that Jesus did not come from God. Case closed. But wait. Someone in the crowd wrapped their mind around what was happening and they spoke up. If this man were a sinner, how could he do such signs? Because this person, whoever it was that spoke up, understood that the purpose of miracles was to authenticate the messenger as divine. So now they're in a quandary and it caused quite a stir. So the Pharisees turned again to the blind man and asked him, what do you have to say about it? And he claimed Jesus was a prophet. It was known that prophets like Moses or Elijah did miracles, so the blind man put Jesus in that category. But the Pharisees were not going to let Jesus have that distinction. They weren't getting far with discrediting Jesus this way, so they decided they'd call in the man's parents. Hopefully, by doing so, they discover some sort of discrepancy. Now, they were fact-checking. Maybe the man wasn't really born blind, and all of this was just some hoax. But what wasn't a hoax was that the man born blind um, actually grew in his understanding of who Jesus was. You see, first when he asked, when they asked who did it, Oh, I, I don't know, this guy named Jesus. <laughs> That's what his name is. Now, look what he says about it. He says he's a prophet. So see, he's grown. There's been some spiritual maturity that's happened here. Let's look at verse 18. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know this is our son, and that he was born blind. 
But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He'll speak for himself. Now, John gives us a little parenthetical note here. In other words, why did they say that? John tells us his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So they drew the parents in, and their interrogation, this is interrogation number two, consisted of two questions. Question number one, is this your son who you say was born blind? They're on the witness stand. They testify, yes, it's our son. Yes, he's born blind. <coughs> Question number two, well, how does he now see? They testify, we don't know, ask him. They were so short with their answers because they didn't want to be kicked out of the temple. We may have friends that are dear to us, children that are dear to us, maybe even our religion is dear to us, but nearer is ourselves. Public faith in Jesus had its consequences, and this couple feared the Jews, and they weren't willing to speak on behalf of their son. Any dead fish can swim downstream, but it takes real courage to push back against the lies. Does fear consume your belief? Are you afraid you'll mess up too bad and miss salvation? Maybe you're afraid God's watching you like a hawk to punish you. Are you afraid that God's disappointed with you? Afraid you're not doing enough? Christianity wasn't meant to be a religion of fear, but one of confidence based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Courage is required when we're called upon to profess faith in Christ before hostile people. But this family wasn't willing to do that. Because to be kicked out of the synagogue was to be kicked out of cultural life. And they weren't willing to take that risk. Getting nowhere, the Pharisees decided to make one last attempt to interrogate the man who was blind. This time in hopes of getting him to trash Jesus' reputation. Look at verse 24. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God, we know this man's a sinner. He answered, Whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> they reviled him, saying, You're his disciple." Well, we're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, What? This is an amazing thing. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind, and if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin. You would teach us? They cast him out. They didn't want anything to do with that. This time, they called the man formerly blind to give glory to God. In other words, solemnly swear that you'll speak the truth. Stop making so much of this Jesus guy and give glory to God. Sin has so twisted their minds, and that's what sin does. It causes confusion and breeds spiritual ignorance. The man who had been blind gave a strong, confident answer. Look again at verse 25. It's very powerful. He said, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. He wasn't confident in answering the sin question, but he did know that this man named Jesus opened his eyes. You and I, church, those of us who are in Christ, must testify to what we know to be true. We're to use that testimony to share the gospel. You see, I, I want to clear up a little confusion here. Sharing your testimony isn't necessarily evangelism. Your testimony is what God did in your life, and it opens the door to being able to share the gospel. But we better be careful not to confuse the two. The gospel isn't about us. It's about what Jesus did for us. And so when we say, I shared my testimony, that's great. It's appropriate to share what God did for you. But if you just stop at what God did for you, then you weren't sharing the gospel because the gospel has to be the sharing of what God did for us. The man born blind could testify to what Jesus did for him, but it wasn't the gospel. 
He didn't share with the Pharisees what Christ had done for them on the cross because the cross hadn't happened yet. Evangelism happens when the evangel is proclaimed to people. And so while he didn't share the gospel, the man born blind did crush their argument. You can almost hear the sarcasm dripping from his lips as he asks if they want to be Jesus' disciple. The Pharisees countered with his comment about being Moses' disciple because they at least knew where Moses came from. And that was a great launching pad for the man formerly blind to pounce upon. This is amazing, he said, that you don't know where Jesus came from. Earlier, you said sinners couldn't do the signs that Jesus was doing because God wouldn't listen to him. Exactly, says the man born blind. Only someone from God can do these kind of signs. Therefore, Jesus must have come from God. Now, that's great progress for a man who earlier just said, I don't know, his name is Jesus, and I don't know where he is, I'm getting blind. Now, all of a sudden, he's claiming that he's from God. Well, that didn't go well with the Pharisees. They excommunicated the man for stating the obvious. Jesus must have come from God. And so the question for us is, are we willing to be cast out of the progressive society in which we live for the sake of our faith? Are we willing to be cast out? It will, that, that question will be put upon us, especially the younger generation. It's going to be even more and more in the days ahead. John Chrysostom Commenting on this passage, passage says, The Jews cast him out of the temple, and the Lord of the temple found him. Look at verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered honestly, right? He says, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Remember, the blind man hadn't seen Jesus yet. Not, knew the voice, maybe. But. He answered, uh, 37. Jesus said to him, you have seen him. Isn't that interesting? He's only been sight. He's only been able to see for a little while. And Jesus says, you've seen him. And it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I came into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. Jesus first reached down to give this man physical sight, and now he offers him spiritual sight. Jesus pointed out the man's need, his greatest need in verse 35. Do you believe? We sang, I believe in God the Father. I mean, do you? That's the question. Do you believe? The man born blind recognizes his need and asks for the Son of Man's identity in order to believe. Only when someone recognizes their spiritual blindness will they turn to Jesus for healing. The man born blind said he believed. And then he worshiped Jesus. He reached the climax of his spiritual journey from only knowing Jesus' name in the beginning, right? He only knew, I don't know, just some guy named Jesus. We've gone from only knowing a guy named Jesus all the way to calling him the Son of God and believing in him. And then what did he do? He worshiped. Because belief motivates our worship. Here's an example. Uh, what we believe about Clemson football elicits some sort of response. For some of you, it's woo! For some of you, it's Arr! And for some of us, it's maybe indifferent, right? Well, what we believe about God elicits a response as well. And it should motivate our worship of Him. And so Jesus wraps up this whole encounter with some powerful closing words. He says, those who think they can see are blind to their own blindness. But those who recognize their blindness will be able to see or have opportunity to see. The way of seeing, friends, is a willingness to admit that we're blind, that we're naked, and that we're hungry. Charles Spurgeon said, it's not our littleness that hinders Christ, but our bigness. It's not our weakness that hinders Christ, it's our strength. It's not our darkness that hinders Christ, it is our supposed light that holds back his hand. The empty will be filled and the blind will see. 
And it's because of Christ that we now sing. Father, I thank you for the gift of Christ to open our spiritual eyes that we might see. And Father, for those of us in here who believe, we can sing that song with confidence. We were saying that was our testimony. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ the Son. We believe in the Spirit, three in one. For those of us who could sing that and that be our testimony, I pray that we would continue to make known as the sent ones now that there is recovery of spiritual sight to the blind. To those walking and stumbling in darkness. God, to those who think they see, maybe even in this room, they, they think they've got the world, evolution, all that figured out. They they recognize we're just a bunch of atoms, primordial soup that just woo, popped out a human, and, and they think they can see. God, I pray that today they might know that that's really blindness. But they don't have to stay blind. Today, their heart might actually see the goodness of God. All possible because of the grace of our God. For by grace we have been saved. By grace we can say, I once was blind, but now I see. Father, I pray that we would go out into the darkness like this man formerly blind and testify to our neighbors Testify to the religious authorities in, in, in terms of, well, not necessarily religious authorities, God, but, but those who might be in authority who might question our motives. We testify not to our families who may not understand what it means to follow Christ. Maybe there's someone in here whose family has rejected them because of their faith. Pray that they might know today that it's worth it to follow you. Thank you for this word today, Father. We love you and pray this in the name of Jesus, our Redeemer. Amen. Church family, we close with a familiar song, Amazing Grace. In that song, we talk about the fact that we once were blind, but now we see. Then you add this little special part about my chains being gone. We really are free. Once we have our spiritual sight, we're free. We're free to run, tell people about the hope offered in Christ. We're free to know that this suffering that we might be walking through now is temporary, really tiny. Doesn't mean that it's not heavy. It's not belittling what you're walking through, but it's recognizing that there's a great God who carries. So in your response today, maybe you'd like just someone to pray with you. I'd be honored to do that. Others in this room would be honored to pray with you. If you want to come down here, maybe just right where you are. I don't know what the Spirit's doing in your life, but let's stand and respond. Just, just let the words wash over you. Amazing grace. Sweet the sound.